In the mountains of Galilee, Lebanon and Horan in Syria, there live a strange people, the custodians of an ancient revelation. Where did they come from? What are their beliefs? And why are these beliefs conveyed only through initiation? For centuries, this people has been cloaked in mystery and secrecy. Today, they still embody one of the enigmas of the Middle East. The Druze first appeared in Cairo, some 400 years after the advent of Islam, caught up in the mystical and social currents produced by Shiism. There, in the sphere of influence of the University of Al-Azhar, in a city where Jews and Christians equaled the Muslims in number, a caliph, Al-Hakim, heralded in a new era. With premonitions of religious wars a century before the Crusades, his dream was to blend all faiths into a single, universal religion. His doctrine, founded on a belief in the unity of God, postulates a totally abstract divinity with none of the attributes that created beings generally ascribed to him. Thus, throughout his life, Al-Hakim strove to put an end to all forms of rite and worship and even to destroy the sanctuaries of the three monotheistic religions. Through this gate, it is said, he would go out every night into the desert to meditate on his unitary teachings, the universal religion stripped of ceremony and internalized. One morning, he mysteriously disappeared, and Hamza, a disciple of Persian origin, took over the work of the departed caliph. Hamza proclaimed, Al-Hakim, the tenth embodiment of God on earth, has not died. On the day of the last judgment, he shall reappear. From Cairo, missionaries left for the most remote parts of Islam, going even as far as India to announce the dawn of a new era. Among them, there was a certain Darazi, who was to leave his name to Druzism. The Druze, however, are convinced that they existed before the period of Al-Hakim, and claim that they are the perpetuators of ancient Gnostic orders, those recondite orders tending towards absolute knowledge of God. From the beginning of time, a chain of initiates, the depositories of the supreme revelation, passed on knowledge to one another. According to Plato, this knowledge can only be handed on to those who have been properly prepared to receive it. The great sage of ancient Egypt, Imhotep, the initiator of his pharaoh, and the creator of the first pyramid in Saqqarat 5,000 years ago, is thought to be one of the initiates the Druze lay claim to, along with Hermes Trismegistus, Melchizedek, Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristotle. It was at the foot of Mount Hermon, in a remote wilderness in the Lebanon, that Druzism took root among the tribes originating in Arabia and the Yemen. From the earliest times, the persecutions inflicted on the sect induced followers to practice al taqiyal enjoining them to comply with the religious tenets of the victor while preserving their faith in their hearts. This principle of conduct has been successfully implemented by the Druze throughout their eight centuries of history, which has always been closely tied to the Lebanese mountains in whose shelter Druze clans and tribes strengthened their particularism under the rule of the emirs. Emir Fakr ed Din's arrival in Florence in 1615 awakened the interest of European courts. 
This prince had succeeded in setting up a young independent state within the Ottoman Empire. The master of the mountain could sign Prince of the Druze in Phoenicia and Mount Lebanon. A century later, decimated by rivalries between emirs, the exodus began for families, clans and tribes. Thus started the Druze settlement of Horan Jebel in Syria. Other exoduses were to follow, particularly in 1860, after the intervention of a French task force siding with the Maronite Christians. The epic of the Lebanese emirs culminates in the refinement of a miniature Versailles that the powerful Bashir II had built at Betedin. It is the epitome of Druze architecture. Lamartine, in his Travels in the East, rejoices in its magnificence and charm. In 1925, the time of the French mandate over Syria, when a Jebel nobleman rejected French tutelage and the offer of an independent Druze state. For two years, his horsemen managed to keep the French army at bay. One day, with his fellow soldiers, he charged an armored enemy column and annihilated it. His feats are often sung today in the Madafas in Jebel, almshouses where the traveler can get board and lodging for as long as he needs. Today, within the world of Islam, the Druze constitute a highly specific community, numbering nearly half a million. 250,000 in Syria, 150,000 in the Lebanon, and 40,000 in Israel. The Druze people are therefore at the very heart of the Arab-Israeli conflict. The situation is all the more tense as the Druze practice al-Takiyal, a teaching whereby they espouse the cause of their respective countries while inwardly retaining their Druze faith. Thus it is that in Israel, young Druze join the army to defend the Jewish state. At the funeral for one of their number, an Israeli minister is to be seen side by side with the head of the community, paying tribute to the deceased. At the same time, across the border, a Druze officer from Syria, in the name of the same Al-Takiyal, has fallen on the field of honor. In the presence of the most high-ranking authorities in the country, the religious hierarchy of Jebel honor him as a hero of the Arab cause. Finally, in the Lebanon, Kamal Jumblat, head of the Lebanese Druze community and a politician enjoying great prestige, chose to side with the Palestinians against Israel and subsequently against Syria. He was to be assassinated at the height of the civil war. His death was mourned by all the Druze as a national loss, for beyond the closed borders of the 20th century, Druze solidarity still rules their hearts.
That day in Israel, there was no question of hoisting the Israeli flag. Only Druze colors were displayed. Green for universal reason. Red for the universal soul. Yellow for the word. Blue for the cosmos. White for the corporal universe. From father to son, these men have handed down to each other the privilege of belonging to the community of the Druze. Belonging gives each member the possibility of acceding to initiatory wisdom. From ignorance, they achieve spirituality. The white tara on their foreheads and their vertically striped jackets signify the various rungs on the initiatory ladder. Nonetheless, these outward appearances are of little importance for the Druze, for the level of communication between the initiate and God depends on his level of knowledge. Your meditation is worth what your being is worth, said the sages. Your God is the God you deserve. He betokens the light or the darkness of your being. Initiation is also accessible to women, as the Druze consider their companions with great respect. They are not inferior or impure beings. Quite the contrary. The Druze woman can reach self-fulfillment by the same route as the man. These initiate women, the Akalasiti, wear a white veil, also a sign of wisdom and purity. Initiation takes time and requires perseverance. In the Lebanon, several schools of religion give courses that lead up to initiation. Here, the masters teach the major principles of Druze wisdom. Personal mystic research, domination of the senses, respect for nature, one's neighbor, and other religions. And when, around his 40th year, the Druze has attained wisdom and achieved spirituality, the doors of the Halwas will open to him, houses of meditation, often in remote mountain areas. The Druze eschew all forms of worship and rite, for they believe that the outward trappings of religion cause divisions among men. There is one unique God. In the Khalwas, the initiates study the seven books of Hamza, a cosmogony on which commentators are undecided even today. It is filled with esoteric writings, strongly tinged with Neoplatonic reminiscences, Indian wisdom, thoughts derived from the Bible, the Gospel and the Quran. It is claimed that the initiates even have ancient sacred texts in their possession. Might it be to the Druze that the supreme revelation was given to assume world government? The initiates are convinced of this. Paradoxically, however, they remain turned in on themselves and show no desire to proselytize. They possess the knowledge, but remain silent, because they know that the truth may only be revealed when mankind is ready to receive it. It should therefore come as no surprise to you if in the Druze mountain villages of Galilee, the Lebanon or Syria, you were to meet some of these wise men, almost a century old, who are capable of talking of Plato, the religions of the Hindus, Jesus Christ or Muhammad. But they are not inclined to talk about their own beliefs. They are bound to silence under the katan, the inviolable secrecy towards non-Druze on all matters related to their revelation. The Druze are particularly attached to simple, humble tasks. They have what one might call the virtue of hope, as for them there is no suffering which is not touched with joy.
Adruz never says that he dies. He says that he transmigrates. It is the most important stage in his life, the time when the soul moves into a new body. You have left me life, proclaims the celebrant, because reincarnation takes place immediately. The soul departing from a body is magnetically attracted to a body being formed, and the influence of the stars governs this exchange. The soul is breathed into the body. The non-initiated are left in relative ignorance of revelation but they are entitled to visit the tombs of patriarchs known in the Bible and the chief saints of early Christianity. The most important Druze sanctuary is in Galilee, the tomb of Jethro, the initiator of Moses. It is said that Jethro left the giant imprint of his foot in the rock, and this place is especially venerated by the faithful. As for the Druze in Syria, traditionally they gather around the tomb of Abel, the son of Adam, a few miles from Damascus. The Druze have their own courts to deal with community business such as marriages, divorces, inheritance and goods belonging to the community. It was Hamza himself who drafted the laws which are still in force today. When a Unitarian takes a sister Unitarian to be his bride, let him deem her his equal in every respect, he ordered. This code accords women a very liberal status. It prohibits polygamy and repudiation. On the other hand, divorce is relatively easy. Marriage to a non-Druze is punished by exclusion from the community. Traditional marriages are rare, for the liberal-mindedness of the Druze keeps pace with the developments in modern societies where ritual is becoming obsolete. The bride's representative, his eyes darkened with coal makeup, presents to the assembly of sages two symbols of the bride's free consent, the ring and the veil. The marriage, therefore, takes place between initiates by proxy. The bride and bridegroom stay off stage, and only after the ceremony will they be able to see each other again.
Several thousand initiates from the Lebanon and Syria gather each year at the tomb of Nabi Ayyub, the biblical Job. The water from the spring, said to have healed the wounds of the holy man, is still held in high esteem for its beneficent properties. <laughs> After a final prayer ceremony, the initiates go up to the Khalwa, where they can meditate on what has been revealed to them. This revelation is not based on faith, as in Christianity, or on submission, as in Islam, but on inner conviction and the stripping away of one's ego to gain knowledge of the Absolute. Traditionally, Non-initiates are forbidden to set foot inside the Khalwe. Another pilgrimage to the tomb of Nabi Shu'eb, or Jethro, near Lake Tiberiad. The 40,000 Druze in Israel, isolated for a quarter of a century from their fellow believers in Syria and the Lebanon, have a tradition of gathering here every spring. This is both a religious and a political festival during which the Druze community plays host to other communities of the country. The triple embrace between initiates symbolizes the humility of superior towards inferior. On the tomb of the Nabi, the pilgrims lay pieces of silk cloth to be torn into strips and worn by the young people. In Drew's theology, Jethro is an important figure. To convey his will to man, God created the highest form of reason through which he imparted a portion of his essence. With Pythagoras and Hamza, Jethro is one of the seven incarnations of the highest form of reason. Their mission is to appear on earth to define truths whenever mankind needs guidance towards its true destiny.
Today, the Druze are awaiting a further incarnation of the highest form of reason. It will be made manifest through the appearance of a great sage whose mission will be to unite all the different religions on earth. Predictions place his coming before the end of the century at a time when all the planets known to the ancients will be grouped under a certain sign of the zodiac. since the time of Caliph al-Hakim, the integrity of Druze revelation has been so adamantly preserved that the Druze have been compared by the historian Arnold Toynbee to fossils living in a fortress. And yet, behind the double ramparts of the secret order and the inviolable mountain, the Druze have always been believers in the ideal of unity. For them, the partitions which create arbitrary separations between beliefs exist only below heaven. Thus it is that every year, some of their number travel to India or to the West to acquire from other wise men and other religions further fragments of truth. For in the Himalayas, Mount Lebanon, the mountains of Scotland, or the Andes, initiation is but one and the same thing. It is the great initiatory chain, which might also be the true universal brotherhood. Mm -hmm. 